This is a Google Hangout. What is the other thing? Podcast. But we're live. Yeah. All right. <laughs> we're live. Neither of us were looking at the camera. Know that. Neither of us were looking at the record. camera. And you can now know my level of, uh, of expertise in the field of these types of uh, procedures. So anyway, we're going to address, I'm Dr. Rutherford. Uh, thanks for coming and watching us again. This is Dr. Randall Gates. I'm primarily these days practicing functional medicine. I'm a certified functional medicine practitioner. I'm also a chiropractor of 35 years. Dr. Gates is a board certified chiropractic neurologist. Mm -hmm. And together we have see a lot of interesting cases and we do these things to share with you our findings. Um, what's working, basically. What uh, Dr. Gates uh, has a particular affinity for uh, research and kind of gives us a foot up on a few things. He does a lot of research all week and, and so uh, a lot of what we do is based on that research. A lot of what we do is based on just years and years and years of seeing what works and what doesn't work with patients. One of the, um, I guess the topic that has come up most over the past year that has the, the, the uh, attention of the public and is now starting to get the attention even of the GI field um, is the GI tract and its, uh, and its role in a lot of different crane, uh, chronic pain syndromes and, and, and different conditions. And today what we want to discuss is a specific um, uh, segment of th that rather, rather wide topic, which I think we're going to discuss uh, pretty thoroughly, relative to GI tract problems, gut problems, bowel problems, however you want to put it, and, and I'll define the gut as uh, um, including even your pancreas and your liver and your gallbladder because they all have uh, connections to the intestines, which is more commonly known as the GI tract. Uh, stomach. So, that we'll, so we're referring to all those things. Okay, we're referring to everything that is in here, uh, and we're going to talk uh, predominantly about your your intestines, your small intestines, and and your large intestines. But we're going to talk about that relative to metabolic syndrome, diabetes syndrome X, pre-diabetes, insulin resistance. All of these mm -hmm. factors that, frankly, are, are in my world, one and the same. And, I, I, and, and, and when I'm listening to a history, and, and, I'm, I, and there are going to be different nuances we're going to talk about uh, that differentiates them. But really, in the, in the, in, in the end, the, these are different gradients and different aspects of, of, of some sort of a blood sugar problem. And, uh, and, and in the functional world, once you start to have blood sugar symptoms or once you start to morph into something called functional norms, um, you, you have a problem that needs to be taken care of. Yesterday, I had two patients in here who had, one had um, pre-diabetes and was being treated for it with metformin. Um, that's not uh, common in the sense that, that a lot of, uh, it's becoming more common. But a lot of times I'm, I, I have patients come in and go, well, I have prediabetes, right. I, have, mm -hmm. I have syndrome X, I have metformin, um, and the doctors have said, let's just wait and see how it goes, and if it becomes diabetes, we'll treat it. In our world, once you have morphed into the any of those segments, um, even though you're not diabetic, it's something that needs to be treated on many levels. Uh, and, then yes, and then I had another gal, we had the gal that we were just discussing beforehand come in, and, um, and she was an interesting case. She was only 22 years old. They've already taken her gallbladder out. By the way, the, there really was no reason, there was no uh, uh, medically necessary documented reason to take her gallbladder out other than she's had problems her whole life. And they didn't know what else to do and they took her gallbladder out. Frankly, pronouncing proudly to her that her symptoms would probably now go away. And uh, they did not. Ultimately, they got worse. They're talking about taking out her colon, and she just has slight inflammation in different parts of her colon. We're going to talk about inflammation. So these are the things we see. Um, she had, um, and, and, and she also may have some of the things that would lead to these syndromes, even though she's 22 and thin, but she had, I, I think, probably SIBO, mm -hmm. which we're going to talk mm -hmm. about, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. So just to try to lay out the... 
the land here. We're going to talk about the GI tract. Those of you who have GI problems and you are just floating all over the place, you're going to, you should get a pretty overall comprehensive view of what's going on in the GI tract, GI tract right now. Metabolic syndrome, diabetes, prediabetes frequently have not been related to the GI tract, and it turns out that these are potentially significant components of uh, a, a successful clinical outcome, the GI tract, and ironically, may be a component of it because the GI tract that you have problems with may be actually be in retrospect causing, or maybe not retrospect's not the good word, may be also uh, causing the, the diabetes, and, and indeed there are, are many studies that indicate that it is. So uh, GI tract. Mm -hmm. I, I would I would start off by saying we we again this is very repetitive. Uh, we treat a lot of chronic problems. Uh, we treat a lot of chronic pain syndromes, a lot of chronic conditions. Um, that when we started out years ago, uh, you know there were, there's been understanding probably for 2,000 years or more that the GI tract is important to a lot of different things. But I don't think a focus has ever come together in Western society as much as it has come together in the recent 10 or 15 years. And we're seeing more and more how much the GI tract plays into virtually every mm -hmm. chronic pain syndrome that there is. And if you, want to, if you want to look at one of our previous hangouts on autoimmune problems or chronic pain syndromes, you'll see that there are many other components. But it seems that if you, if you don't start with the GI tract, and if you don't get that under control, I think you're pretty much sunk in trying to really control a chronic pain problem um, without drugs mm -hmm. or without surgery mm -hmm. or something. Yeah, would you think would that agree. might be a, a correct I statement? Agree. Yes. You want to like take off in that direction or? Okay. Um, relative to chronic pain. I mean, we're talking pain, GI tract. To... Well, we're talking GI tract. Maybe maybe that's a little general. We're talking GI yeah. tract. So that's where you need to start relative to insulin resistance and metabolic syndrome. So first let's look at what metabolic syndrome really is. A lot okay. of people have heard of it. In essence, it was a term that started in the 1920s where some physicians noticed that people with bigger waist girths, so so-called, you know, like the rotund abdomen, they had a higher incidence of cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes and things of that nature. It then became first really acknowledged in 1988 at a seminar where a gentleman said, you know, we need to call this metabolic syndrome because we see that it's associated with a lot of different problems, not only cardiovascular disease, but, you know, things like prediabetes, as Dr. Rutherford was so they're saying to. it because it, it involves your whole metabolism? Yeah, and in essence, they started observing that it gives someone like a five times increased chance of having diabetes, this metabolic syndrome, as well as a two time increased chance of dying from a heart attack. And with all that preamble said, basically metabolic syndrome is defined by many different organizations, so it can right. vary. Uh, but simplistically, it's when someone has a larger waist girth than their hip girth, there are ratios that are used, but that is the generality. They tend to have problems with blood sugar regulation, as Dr. Rutherford was alluding to. They go to their general practitioner, they have a blood test done, and their blood sugar is now above 100 but it's not up to 125, which is diabetes. They may have uh, an increased hemoglobin A1C, which is a three-month measure of blood sugar, how much basically blood sugar attaches to red blood cell that lives about 90 to 100 days. They may have an impaired fasting, or excuse me, impaired glucose tolerance test where you give someone 75 grams of carbohydrates and seeing how fast they clear that carb. Metabolic syndrome patients can't do that. And then they also have a tendency to have increased blood pressure and increased cholesterol and things of this nature. Right. Now, we've always known that these factors can predispose someone to diabetes, but now the relationship relative to the gut is becoming clear, okay. it's defined, and it's almost irrefutable. So you look like you wanted to say something. There. No, just metabolic. So metabolic, I know uh, we looked up what people were interested in before we did this, and, and people were interested in the definition of metabolic syndrome, what it meant. And so essentially, what Dr. Gates is explaining to you, there's a lot of different, there's a lot, of, when they started putting this together, they called it metabolic, it, it affects your blood sugar, it affects your heart, it affects your cardio, it affects your cholesterol. So they just gave a general term to it. Mm -hmm. Something is going wrong with your metabolism. And it's a syndrome, and if you have all of these things, or three of them, isn't it? 
Is it like three, three to five? Three, three out of five, five of these. Out of you five, don't have yeah. to have them all. Exactly. You have to have only like three of them. And now you are at, they, they knew you were at risk for this. At the time that that uh, syndrome was coined, um, I don't think they really knew what was like what was causing it, and, and you could argue they were just finding out what's causing it. And um, and and syndrome X, I don't think we said syndrome X. We said metabolic syndrome, pre-diabetes, mm -hmm. which I think most people understand. Pre-diabetes, what Dr. Gates said. Pre-diabetes is um, if your blood sugar is between 100 and 120. 5, 126, something like that, three times. I think it's supposed to be three times. You're supposed to get your blood sugar measured three times, and if you're over 126, three times. Then you have um, diabetes. You are now no longer pre-diabetes. And now a lot of doctors, the reason I'm mentioning that is not is not to be redundant, but it's that a lot of doctors will not treat you until then. We're going to make the point you need to be treated way before then, way before then. And metabolic syndrome, diabetes, pre-diabetes, as they relate to the GI tract. Um, so let's go to the GI tract relative to that because um, what Dr. Gates is going to tell you is something that we were exposed to several months ago, but uh, he's been doing a lot of research on this. And several months ago, it was it was kind of a theory and theoryishness. Mm -hmm. And now there's been a lot of data coming out showing that that you have blood sugar problems and you get a gut problem, you pretty much need to fix your gut. Mm -hmm. To get that, the, those people who come in here who are metformin and uh, glucophage. I saw one a couple weeks ago. Was on four blood sugar medications, and and the readings were still in a diabetic range. There's something wrong. Those of you who are out there who are taking even one medication and you can't get it down into under a diabetic range or into a low insulin resistance range. There's something wrong. Well, we we've talked about thyroid being involved with that, but the mm -hmm. gut is a huge contributor in an enormous amount of cases. And I know those are very general terms, but we don't have figures on them yet. We don't have percentages. We just we're just gonna tell you we see it a lot in these cases. So I'm gonna I'm gonna defer to Dr. Gates for this part. Um, Dr. Gates does most of the treatment here and he's 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 really kind of engaged more day to day and he'll, he can go over a lot of the nuances of the gut and how it affects your blood sugar and your metabolic syndrome. And and, and not to leave you syndrome X people out, okay, but I kind of put that all in the same category. To me, they're all variations of, of a blood sugar-ish type of an issue, and, and so that's how we look at it clinically. But Okay. So in essence, what we're now seeing is that with the pre-diabetic person, let's just term it pre-diabetes okay. from here on out. Um, the pre-diabetic person tends to have to secrete more insulin for a given load of carbohydrate than they should. So meaning you eat the bagel, we've used this example a hundred times, you eat the bagel and you have to produce a ton of insulin to get that bagel into your cells like your muscle cells, your liver, other cells throughout your body, fat cells as an example. And as time wears on, if you keep beating up your body where you have to make more and more and more insulin. Finally, the pancreas will burn out over a period of approximately 10 years, 10 to 20 years, and then you go on full-blown diabetes. But So that's kind of the scenario of blood sugar. But as that relates to the gut, what we're now seeing is that there are bacterial components in our gastrointestinal tract. They are termed lipopolysaccharide. They should be mainly in our gastrointestinal tract. We should not have high levels of lipopolysaccharide floating throughout our bloodstream. Many of you will remember toxic shock syndrome and as it related to lye tampons, I believe it was in the mm -hmm. late 1980s, and they found that these tampons allowed certain bacteria to fester on them when they were still located in that region of the anatomy. And then the lipopolysaccharide would float throughout the female's body and make her extremely right. sick. So there's barriers in the intestine that should, that should prevent these lipo, uh, lipopolysaccharides from getting out of the intestine and into your bloodstream. Same way as, and we're going to talk about something later um, called the leaky gut, and, and it's the same with that. Undigested food that is in your gut should be going into the toilet. It should not be going into your bloodstream. And so these are two very important aspects for those of you who have blood sugar problems and have gut problems. So, mm -hmm. so just to make that clear, exactly. lipopolysaccharides, if you find them in a bloodstream, there's a problem. They don't belong there. And we're seeing that in 
the pre-diabetics and diabetic patients that the lipopolysaccharide per se is not as high as it would be in someone with toxic shock, but it's much higher than it should be. And from that, we have started to learn that this lipopolysaccharide from the gut is, as Dr. Ruffer is saying, is filtering into our bloodstream through basically holes in the dam is a good way to think about it. The gastrointestinal tract should be tightly bound together. Nothing should really be getting through it. But we're now seeing things are leaking through. And a few articles came out, you know, in 2014 and one was in late 2013, where they, in essence, showed that things are filtering through in pre-diabetics and diabetics. Now, this concept of the leaky gut, we've been working with for a while. Right. And it seems to be one that my more nutritionally astute patients mm -hmm. are coming in and getting consultants, and they're like, now they're like, leaky gut, leaky gut, which is a term that grinds on us like fingernails on a, on a, on a, on a, on a on a blackboard, an old chalk blackboard. It, 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 it's, in, it's in intestinal permeability. Mm -hmm. is, is the, I think defines it better, which means your intestines have become permeable. They have things making their way through the intestines. The intestinal lumen, the hole, is here. Here's where the food goes. This is the wall. Now it gets through here. That's what Dr. Gates is talking about. There are cells that are tightly bound to not let it get through there. And it gets through, and in here is the blood, is the bloodstream. And it gets into that. And, and the point I wanted to make is, up until very recently, it's been a theory, really. It's been disputed, and still is disputed by many in the medical community. I don't think it's disputed that much by the alternative community at this point in time. Um, and, and we're not, again, we say it every week, we're not anti-medicine, we're just telling you what you're up against out there. And so uh, it's, it's, it's been disputed as a, uh, uh, as a fact, but Dr. Gates has some other research that will... Um, right. And they're all attached, or they should be attached, I believe they're attached, Kevin, aren't they? To the hangout, the, uh, the clipboard, the article. You're talking today. about the, uh, the uh, research articles. Yeah. yeah. Okay, yeah. so you can find them at the bottom of this hangout on powerhealthtalk.com. But there's 28 references. Uh, for those of you who have any um, curiosity or question as to the validity of leaky gut syndrome, as Dr. Rutherford is saying, I really point you to reference three, um, as well as there's one on chromium as you go down the list. Uh, I'll let you find it, but it talks about chromium okay. relative to diabetes. Anyways, number three is the fantastic one, and more importantly on that note, it's from this year, it's 2014. So lots of times, you know, doctors, medical doctors, they're incredibly bright people, but it's almost impossible to stay completely up on the research on every subject. Right. So maybe as of their training five years ago, leaky gut syndrome was just a theory. Well, now leaky gut syndrome is a phenomena, and it's... Right. As Dr. Rutherford said, in our opinion, it's pretty irrefutable. And as a practical matter, just as a practical matter, you're maybe sitting there wondering, like, what has this got to do with me? Do I have leaky gut? Most of the patients, here's what I say, would say. I listen to consults. I listen to histories every day. And if you've had tenderness, if you've had inflammation, if you have food allergies, if you have food allergies to gluten, if you have any of these, if you've had a bad gut, if you've had tenderness and a bad gut and constipation for years, you can pretty much be assured you have this syndrome. That the, because the inside of the gut is what? One cell in thickness? Mm -hmm. doesn't take a whole lot to damage the inside of your, of your intestines, uh, particularly the small intestines where things are very active. And so if you want to know why we're emphasizing this intestinal permeability or now it's even showing up in the in the scientific literature as leaky gut because that's what people understand. Um, this is why it is, it, it is very common. It leads to a lot of things that ultimately lead to your blood sugar problem and ultimately if you have a blood sugar problem that has that you're taking medication for and it's kind of not working, trust me, this is probably where you need to start. This is probably where the rubber meets the road. So that's why we're emphasizing this phenomenon. So then, now that we have it well established that this lipopolysaccharide can float into the bloodstream, the current research is showing that this lipopolysaccharide... Which comes from the inside of the gut. Which comes from the inside of the gut. And let's call it LPS. Has to be, the gut has to be damaged for this to happen. So the LPS now 
can cause insulin resistance. So basically the LPS can go into our cells and it won't allow receptors to go to the outside of the cell so insulin can bind to the cell to allow glucose to come into the cell. If, I hope you're with me. Hope, did that make sense? I, you know what, we were going to use the term pre-diabetes and then we just went to insulin resistance. Okay, pre-diabetes. Again, okay. we go back to metabolic syndrome, pre-diabetes, insulin resistance, syndrome X, and our world in essence is really all the same thing for those of you who are watching. So. Okay, so for the pre-diabetic person, the LPS goes into the cell, it doesn't allow the insulin receptor to go to the cell membrane and therefore your body has to make more insulin to get that carbohydrate into your cell. And then if you eat a feast of pasta rather than just a bagel, the likelihood becomes that you can't get all that sugar into your cells. And then excessive sugar starts circulating throughout the bloodstream and attaches to red blood cells, and it can cause a host of other now, if you want to know if that's you, if you get tired after a pasta meal, that's you because it's very, like very draining to the system to have to to have to change that insult or that uh, excess uh, sugar in the system mm -hmm. that's not getting into your cells into triglycerides, that stuff that you see around around your belly there. So now we've established bad bacteria from the gut causing prediabetes and we have the literature here to support it. Now prediabetes is a really important topic for a number of our patients who are autoimmune, for our patients who cannot lose weight, all of you out there. This is a critical piece to the puzzle as well as our pre-diabetic peripheral neuropathy, small fiber neuropathy patients. So many people out there, you know, they want to lose weight and they eat a healthy diet and they say, you know, I just can't lose weight. I'm exercising, I'm restricting my calories. I look at a cupcake and I put on two pounds. You know, that's a common complaint that we hear. What you need to realize is that it may not be your fault. It may be a bacterial problem in your intestines as well as this thing called leaky gut syndrome that could be a huge player in your inability to lose weight. A huge player, and who would ever think that your gut is causing you to be overweight? Well, now the literature has come out, and we've talked about it in other hangouts, where they're now showing that obese people have different bacteria in their intestines right. than lean people. And I even attached a study on rats, but this has been substantiated in humans, where they do exactly that. They take bacteria from obese rats, put them in lean rats, and they take bacteria from lean rats, put them in obese rats, and they can change the rat's body weight just by changing the bacterial makeup now termed the microbiome right. of the intestines. And this is a very modifiable environment. So we're seeing that these bad bacteria that plague the pre-diabetic, insulin-resistant, obese person feed on certain foods. They really like certain foods, and they grow on those foods. Right. And if you restrict those foods, then lots of times the bad bacteria... Away. Yeah. And you know, we, 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 we actually didn't... We kind of sorted the weight loss... You know, we do have patients who come in for weight loss, but that's not like right. what we what we really do. And uh, and the reason that we do have people that come in for that is they've heard from someone else who's come in for something else that they lost weight without having to go to the gym and get on the scale and do all this stuff. And what we noticed in the first four or five years that we were doing chronic pain was all of our patients were losing weight. None of them came in for that. But there were some that weren't, mm -hmm. and 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 um, and then we started getting some people coming in specifically to lose weight, and um, and then some of them have a, had a difficult time. We didn't get the results that we were hoping to get, that we thought we were going to get, because we saw it so consistently in our chronic pain patients that they would just the weight would just literally just pour off of them. And then uh, we went to a seminar, and this was brought up as a topic, and Dr. Gates started the research and had implemented in our treatments. And it's made a huge difference in, right. in people's ability to lose weight. We rarely have someone at this point who doesn't lose weight mm -hmm. if they go through this whole program and right. get all those things evaluated. So it is a big deal relative to your blood sugar. If you want to know about losing weight, we have a whole hour or somewhere on losing weight. One of the main things that's going to cause you to not lose weight, if it's not controlled, is if you have a blood sugar problem that's not being controlled or not being addressed or, or you're taking the medication and it's not working, this got us over that hump right? In, 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 in addressing the GI symptoms first, but then ultimately, and you can probably explain a little bit further why that got us over that hump, I'm, I'm thinking of this, of this. Right, and so we use a specific supplement that goes in and kills these bad bacteria. And so, and that's what we've really found to be 
a major factor in not only helping patients who go through our program and the few who couldn't lose weight, but also our weight loss results in our experience have almost doubled since we've started right. using this antimicrobial therapy for the gastrointestinal tract. Right. And so now we have this situation, let's just summarize, LPS in the gut goes into the bloodstream, causes prediabetes, syndrome X, insulin resistance, all these things. And now we look at what do these bad bacteria that have the LPS on them, what do they feed on? We can eliminate that, but just like weeds in the garden, sometimes weeds can grow without water or without sunlight, you know, they grow on top of a rock. You just wonder how it's even possible. Well, these bacteria sometimes can remain lodged in the intestines, so you have to use an antimicrobial therapy to remove them, and that's where we see some pretty dramatic changes. Right. Now, that's not even talking about healing the gut, which we'll get into later. And relative, so again, relative to those of you who have been diagnosed or been told you have metabolic syndrome or prediabetes or insulin resistance or syndrome X, and are not eating badly, and maybe right. are eating foods that may be perpetuating inflammation in the gut. We need to mm -hmm. maybe address that. Um, and, and you're wondering why you suddenly have become diabetic. Well, this is probably the reason. Um, and, and that's one of the things that I, again, that's one of the things I, I sit with patients come in and go, I don't, I don't crave sugars. I'm not, you know, I, I eat pretty good and my blood sugars are 116 or my blood sugars are 120. Mm -hmm. Uh, how's your gut? You know, it's really not that good, but that's not what I came here for. I came here for my blood sugar. So just to put that a little bit in a practical perspective so that you understand why we're trying to, to help you to, to, to – it's not a new concept, but it is a concept that is now finally being embraced. Right. I mean, like you said, metabolic syndrome in and of itself was has been around for a while, but, but the understanding of, of, the, of the concept of, of the gut, the blood sugar – the gut may be causing blood sugar problems, perpetuating blood sugar problems, and then into going into that whole thing. And no one's really talking about it. And so everything on metabolic syndrome right now, you know, I have this great article on it. I don't even think it's attached to it. You're right. No one is talking about it. But relative to metabolic syndrome, it says, okay, so you're overweight, you know, your cholesterol is up, your blood pressure is up, you're going to have a heart attack most Maybe likely, stat, right? and you're pre-diabetes. Yeah, and so really the medical management is all about metformin and statin drugs. Which metformin. is great for your peripheral neuropathy patients because metformin and statin drugs both can cause peripheral neuropathy. And that was New Jersey sarcasm if you didn't get that. Yeah, and so the medical management is, okay, we're going to put you on a statin, a cholesterol-lowering medication, we're going to put you on an antihypertensive medication, and, you know, you need to watch your diet. And we know that when someone has increased waist girth, that fat in their abdomen is inflammatory. It is. And so we see that metabolic syndrome patients have increased levels of inflammation, and all these things create this vicious cycle. You know, then the fat, because, you know, what is it? It's like two miles of capillaries that we have to have for every pound of fat that we have. And so now you have increased resistance from a cardiovascular standpoint to get all the blood through your fat and your tissues, so then blood pressure goes up. And now we have this vicious circle of a nightmare, really, physiologically, that's predisposing a person to stroke, heart attack, diabetes, on and on and on. But like I said, no one's really talking about the gut as being a major player in this. And what we see clinically and what's coming out in the research is just profound that we can really modify all those factors by going to one simple thing, the gastrointestinal tract. Practically. Very practical. I try to stay practical here. And just in a sense of, 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 of people are sitting here trying, they're, they're, if they're viewing in or they're going to view in in the future, they're looking for answers. Here's, a, here's something that I think really would be helpful for people to understand. For example, the lady who came in, the young lady who came in yesterday morning, um, her GI, her, 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 her uh, colonoscopy was relatively normal. People are sitting there saying, well, but my colonoscopy is relatively normal. Okay, well, let's talk about that. So um, what would be a great analogy for this? So if you had a steak, <laughs> one's in the fridge, freshly bought, and you have one that was in the fridge, but now it's been sitting out for like a day and a half probably the steak still looks about the same, mm -hmm. you know. And so a colonoscopy is a macroscopic view. I mean, we're just looking to see is there a tear in there, do you have cancer, do you have polyps growing. That's what a colonoscopy is there to do. Exactly. We're talking about microscopic things that require right. either stool cultures, very uh, 
very in-depth laboratory testing or even electron microscopy. So a lot of these bad bacteria have been shown through electron microscopy, which is 100,000 times more powerful than the average microscope. Maybe it's the naked eye. I always forget that statistic, but it's extremely powerful. So in essence, we're, you know, it's apples to oranges. It's not even the same thing. Right, and this is not what's done as a standard in your, in your, in your workup. Uh, colonoscopies, endoscopies, these are what, is you, what are used. Yet daily, if you're one of these folks that, you know, you have gas, you have constipation, you have diarrhea, you have alternating constipation and diarrhea, you have gas that's peeling the paint off the walls or something, I will tell you this is probably happening, but you, you may be one of those sitting there saying, well, but I went to my doctor, and my doctor did a GI, told me it well, looked perfect. Mm -hmm. Tell you what, I, the, the one gentleman a couple days ago said, the guy told me I had one of the nicest looking colons there was. Yeah, he had every single colon symptom that there was. So it, it takes quite a bit of damage for it to show up in a colonoscopy. And as Dr. Gates just said, they're not looking for it. Um, there are a lot of things that can play into this. Gluten sensitivities, for example, can play into this. And, I, and the reason I'm bringing that up is, uh, again, we have gluten sensitivities, we have we have so many different names for it. Okay, it's cel I have been diagnosed with celiac, um, actually tested positive for it. But the tests are poor. The one I wanted to mention was you could go in. We we have this concept that well, if you go inside and you look, that must be it. Well, you can go inside and take a biopsy of your your gut to see if you have damage there that would indicate gluten celiac problems. But the, the intestine's like 28 feet long. And, and there's a lot of different places that can be damaged, and there's a lot of different places that may not be damaged. And it's not like they can tell which is damaged or not. The colonoscopy looks good. They take a biopsy. If they get it out of a good part of you, it comes out normal. And now you're told that this horrendous problem that you have, maybe it's stress. That's what they told the guy yesterday. Mm -hmm. Well, the, and this gal yesterday was not stressed, let me, let me tell you. <laughs> and, you know, that brings up another interesting point. So you'll see in Article 3, and Kevin, I think we even put it up on Facebook. At least I sent it to you. It should be up on Facebook pretty soon, my explanation of Article 3, where I sent it to you and I highlighted certain <laughs> phrases and then explained in lay terms. Kevin is our director for all of you. Uh, Google Hangout, Power Health Strong. Producer. Fans. He's our producer and director. So anyways... In that article, they talk about looking at zonulin uh, in the bloodstream. Because, as Dr. Fletcher says, we just can't go in and look at the entire intestine and really get a, a detailed view of what's going on, take little pieces of your intestines out. That would not be uh, efficacious or <laughs> practical. But now we're seeing that we In can, other words, it wouldn't work. Exactly. <laughs> the cells of your intestine should be tightly bound together. And they're tightly bound together principally by these proteins called zonulin and occludin. They're like guy wires. Any of you who have driven over the Bay Bridge, going from Oakland to San Francisco, you see all those guy wires holding the bridge together. Well, that's what zonulin and occludin do. And we're seeing in diabetics and pre-diabetics that zonulin and occludin is like floating throughout the bloodstream in way too high of an amount. In Which essence, is where it just, doesn't belong. Exactly. In essence, it means that the intestines are breaking down. Bad bacterial components are floating in, the LPS. And that's how we're diagnosing now. There is a test for it. There is a test. And this article... But, but from, it's, not, it's not a test that's been embraced and, at this point by the standard medical community. But the molecular and cell biochemistry article uh, from 2014 right. here, really that's the test they're basically it, using. Right. We used to use what's termed the lactulose mannitol test where they would see how many certain types of sugars that were absorbing through the intestines, and if too much of it was in your urine, then that meant you had leaky gut syndrome. I also referenced the chromium article where basically they had diabetics drink chromium compared to controls, and I saw that there was way too much chromium in the bloodstream of these diabetics, and they theorized that it's because it's leaking through. Actually, they substantiated that it's leaking through. So that's how we're now diagnosing that someone has you know, pre-diabetes and it's coming from the gut. And, the, and another interesting thing is that... Well, you didn't mention Cyrex. I didn't. Oh, you, you know, Cyrex array 2. Okay, so the test that, that I was referring to and the one that we use. Right. Okay, the one that we use and was used in one of these studies. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's called the Cyrex array 2. It's from uh, Cyrex Labs in Arizona. Mm -hmm. And the challenge is to get your doctor to do it because a lot of times you're going to go into your doctor. It's, it's not a test they're familiar with, but it's a... It, it's a blood test. Mm -hmm. Is it a DNA test? Mm -hmm. It's just it's an antibody test. It's just an antibody test. It's just an antibody test 
that measures the antibodies to these uh, substances when they get in your bloodstream because they don't belong in your bloodstream. And if they don't belong in your bloodstream, your body views them as a foreign object, then it creates an antibody to it like it would create an antibody so that the virus doesn't come back in your system and get you again. And now you have a problem. And, now, and then those flying around pieces are going to contribute to you either perpetuating or creating a blood sugar problem, metabolic syndrome, diabetes, syndrome X, et cetera. So the test we find is pretty useful. What, what is its sensitivity? Is it like, they quote like 97%. Yeah, 97%. For the, for the record, that's about as sensitive a test as you get. It's not 100%. So three out of 100 who take that test who have it are going to be told they don't have it. Um, but that's pretty good. And, uh, and, it, and it's been a valuable tool for us. It's probably the most sensitive test out there and, and, and the most cost effective. And it's just a blood test. You don't have to right. you don't have to go through a lot of these other hoops and so on and so forth. So for those of you who are looking for some solutions, and if you're working with alternative doctors, I don't think you would have a problem getting your alternative doctor to at least investigate this. This is starting to become popular in the alternative field. Now I don't I don't consider ourselves alternative. A lot of people do. We work within the medical we work with the medical community. We're not medical doctors, but we do have medical doctors that we work with on certain on, on, on a percentage of our cases, it, it just takes an integrated uh, approach to, to deal with these things, and we're not very dogmatic about it. However, I will say that the alternative community um, is, is latching onto this much more rapidly than the, uh, it, it's, it's really a nice tool that somebody can use to show the patient, say, look, you have leaky gut, not only do you have it, but you can tell whether it's pretty mild or whether it's moderate or mm -hmm. whether it's severe. And the advantage of that for your practitioner is, you know, if we have if you have if they have one person that they have assessed relative to what's causing their leaky gut, and they're dealing with that, and that patient's maybe not responding as quickly as patient B and patient C, this test will tell them, well, it's because you have so much damage that you're just gonna have to wait longer for your for your gut to heal. If they're if they're following the appropriate uh, protocols for that, so I'm just, and and this is what I think part of what people are looking for. So I'm mm -hmm, just trying to mm -hmm. give them some some practical data there. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And, and inflammation, you feel like uh, inflammation is a big big issue. Everybody was pretty much now all over inflammation, and people don't really get what causes it. We we've also talked about that. Mm -hmm. Um, and a lot of people are coming in here and, and, and they're all over taking the anti-inflammatory stuff, yet they're still here. They're still here. Okay, they're still here because they're still sick. If they stop taking their, their pomegranate juice or whatever, right. uh, and, all the, and I'm not cutting that down, I'm just saying that, you know, me, I'm kind of like, okay, we got inflammation, why do I have to drink this stuff every day for the rest of my life? So like, what's the inflammation, what's causing the inflammation? Let's kind of get rid of that. So to that, I would say on our clipboard at the bottom of the uh, reference list, go to Article 10, Influence of Gut Microbiota on Subclinical Inflammation and Insulin Resistance. So in essence there, they're saying exactly that. You know, what's the cause of the inflammation? We know that the fat cells break down and they create all these inflammatory <sighs> vicious cycles. Again, I mean, inflammation likes to keep itself in business, whether it's just purely from metabolic syndrome or from autoimmune disease. So the fat cells create more inflammation, and then that creates more inflammation, more insulin resistance, and the thing just keeps going. It causes your brain to not know when you're full, so you just keep eating, on and on and on. But here, we're actually showing that the inflammation, in large part, is coming from the gastrointestinal tract. And if we calm down that gastrointestinal tract, and that's what we see clinically. I mean, we could do a research study someday, a, a retrospective study, where we go back and we track people's inflammatory levels, and they almost invariably always go down through right. this in process. And that's right. why Dr. Rutherford says if you don't treat the gut for a chronic pain condition, and that could really entail from chronic pain to peripheral neuropathy to inability to lose weight, then from an alternative standpoint, when you're not using medications, you are just absolutely spinning your Spinning your wheels. If you're that's been people, our experience. I, we, we, I mean, you can give people curcumin until the cows come home, but if you're not addressing this factor, where 70% of the immune system is, and so much of this inflammation is coming from the gut, and we're not even talking right. about here. We haven't even got into these food antigens that leak through the leaky gut syndrome right. that can stimulate the immune system as well. So, anyways, I got excited, but I wanted to point that out. 
So it's a it's a so that's where functional medicine goes. By the way, just for the record, not to be not to be promoting or anything. But the question always says, okay, you're taking turmeric, you're drinking the uh, anti-inflammatory juices, which have tons of antioxidants in them, and so on and so on. But you're still sitting here in front of me, usually as a patient, with uh, frequently some some still significant symptoms, even with temporarily quenching the inflammation um, day by day. So getting to the inflammation in the gut is a big part of controlling your blood sugar. You got to keep remembering that what we're dealing with here is folks that have blood sugar problems. Relative to that blood sugar issue and the gut, is there anything else that you'd like to discuss or is that like you consider that? There, there, are, other, there are other factors. You want to stick mainly with the SIBO and the, and the leaky gut? That was yeah, I, I, I'm perseverating that I need to read this. Is that okay? Yeah. Okay. So this is out of Experimental Revolutions of Clinical Immunology. This is November of last year. Perseverating means he can't let it go. <laughs> it has been proposed that changes in the composition of the gut microbiota, that's the microbiome, contribute to the development of diabetes type 1. We didn't even talk about diabetes type 1. We talked about that in the autoimmune. Right. Um, broadcast we did I think two or three weeks ago but diabetes type 1 and we can get to that later on diabetes type 2 which includes all of you metabolic syndrome patients out there and pre diabetics and 3 the latter known as Alzheimer's disease so we're now seeing that blood sugar dysregulation from the gut can be associated with Alzheimer's disease they are now referring in the literature to Alzheimer's as diabetes type 3 how interesting is that? The onset of these diseases is affected by complex interactions of genetic and several environmental factors. Alterations in gut microbiota in combination with specific diets can result in increased intestinal permeability leading via a continuous state of low-grade inflammation to the development of insulin resistance. I mean, that says it. That doesn't say it. I don't know what says it. This is an immunology journal, so that's the difference now. You know, we have endocrinology, and we have neurology, and, you know, all the neurologists get into Alzheimer's, and what's going on with the little plaques in the brain that are causing the memory cells to deteriorate? You know, we have people focusing on, okay, so how much metformin do you have to take, and are you needing insulin? And really the advantage, and we can't take credit for coming up with this. I mean, our, our predecessors in functional medicine, functional neurology, mm -hmm. have given us the tools to know this, but right. now we as a community of alternative practitioners have stepped back and say, okay, well, let's look at the gut. Let's look at where it all starts from. And now the literature is overflowing with data supporting what was really just a theory many years ago. And right. I think those people need who were naturopaths and who were chiropractors back in the day and the alternative doctors who were stepping out on a limb who were MDs really deserve a lot of credit. Yeah. Because they were right. Well, because and you get beat up. Yeah, they got I, completely. I can beat up. tell you, you get beat up, and you get beat up, and you get beat up, and then the doctors say it's not uh, uh, that's dumb, and there's no such thing as this, and there's no such thing as metabolic syndrome, there's no such thing as gluten sensitivities, and then eventually what happens is you see it so much in your practice, you keep practicing, people keep getting improvements. Well, eventually, somebody in the medical community decides maybe we ought to study this. And they study it, mm -hmm. and they find that it is legitimate. Then they tell us that we don't know, or that we're not qualified <laughs> to do it. <laughs> and that kind of happens. So again, uh, and I and and forgive me if I if I'm repetitive or and, or or trying to you know just I think a salient point there is a lot of our patients who come in with blood sugar problems do have cognitive dysfunction that may or may not reach the level of being called Alzheimer's. It might be I have significant short-term memory loss. I have, I have, uh, I have brain fog, uh, which can be a lot of things contributing to it. But but if you are sitting there with syndrome X, insulin resistance, metabolic syndrome, and you are uh, pre-diabetes and so on and so forth, and you're experiencing any of that, here's the flow. The flow is fix the gut. That's going to fix the blood sugar, and your brain needs. It is this is basic physiology. One of the things your brain needs to, well, I'm going to go. I'm going to say two of the things your brain needs to function normally is it needs normal blood sugar, not too much and not too little, not high blood sugar, not low blood sugar. It needs normal blood sugar, and it needs a lack of inflammation. What have we been talking about? Fix the gut. 
fix the gut first and see what's left, okay? There's more to chronic pain than what we're talking about, but this is really where the rubber meets the road. If a patient comes in and we take a history and we do an exam, there's seven potential physiological problems going on there, and we work with the gut, five of them might go away or in, or in, 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 the, in the clinical world might resolve, might actually start to, the pathways may start to resynchronize themselves and things may start uh, fixing themselves. Now we have one or two left we can focus on and say, okay, now we can now we can address this. You know, and then now it's where you get into all the other things of you know heavy metals and infections and 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 things of that nature, parasites and all that type of stuff. Mm -hmm. Well, parasites largely is uh, <laughs> relative to the gut. So uh, so we're making that point. We we for years. Um, have been affiliated with a lot of different alternative practitioners and we've certainly conversed with them trying to see what worked for them, what worked for us. Um, our nature just is to take on the more difficult cases because that's where you find out you know, where, the, where the limits are and, and that's where you find out what can and cannot be done. And we would try a lot of different things and eventually once we started hitting the uh, GI tract first as opposed to what we used to do it maybe a little farther down the line our results got much better. Uh, patients got better quicker. Um, they got better results when, the, as we stated earlier, once we started hitting this with the, uh, once we started realizing that there was actually bacterial overgrowth in there, and we started using this berberine, uh, which is what we're using. It's a natural antibiotic that only kills the um, bad bacteria. <laughs> It's a wonderful thing, and it's it's not a drug. It's very very powerful. It's very effective. You have to watch when you take it. Uh, you have to learn how to dose yourself, or it can make you really sick. Frankly, <laughs> as we've seen when we were starting with this, but these start, but these things have come together, and all of a sudden we're seeing we're seeing uh, Alzheimer's patients. That I, we agree that Alzheimer's, probably diabetes of the brain, probably diabetes and inflammation. Right, and you can argue the inflammation is coming from from the, the diabetes. diabetes. Yeah, 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 exactly. Exactly. As so, long as, I mean, we have a gal right now. She, I could, we would correspond during her weekly visit, and she really had a hard time holding her thoughts. She came in for memory loss. She didn't have quite Alzheimer's at this point. Yeah. She's already lost 15 pounds. She looks great. She's discoursing with me in a normal matter, and it's just, it's really phenomenal to see. It's yeah. Phenomenal to see. So, got. And one thing I want to say. I want to talk about a patient yesterday, once you finish your thought. No, go ahead. So I had this patient yesterday, and she may be watching, and I'm not going to mention her name. But her, she says, you know, well, my, you know, my significant other just doesn't understand why I can't lose weight. You know, diet and exercise should do it. And I said, you know, well, you know, we, that significant other could also say, well, why doesn't that MS patient just get up by the wheelchair and start walking? <laughs> you know, just pull up your bootstraps, as we commonly hear there are things blocking the metabolic syndrome patient who is eating 1,200 calories a day and still can't lose weight, and they can't regulate their blood pressure, and they can't regulate their blood sugar or their cholesterol. There are things that are blocking that. What we see consistently are these gastrointestinal factors. And if you clean those up, not only will that get better, but a host of other problems. Yeah, a lot of you lose weight. Blood pressure medications will start to decrease or go away. Mm -hmm. Blood sugar medications. Yeah. Will start to decrease or go away. I mean, I'm not. That's just what you'll see. I don't think that there's anything arguable about mm -hmm. that. I think it's it's uh, it's not an alternative thing. It's in the literature, and, and you see it all the time. So, and then we also any, go ahead. What were you gonna say? No, no. All right. I was gonna say any other aspects of this uh, topic, the blood sugar related to the to the GI tract. Yeah, one thing I wanted to go on was that this started. Um, last week when we were putting together literature for a neuropathy book as is being researched to diabetes and prediabetes. And so the pre-diabetic small fiber neuropathy patients out there, what that means is that these are patients who have tingling, lots of times burning and shooting pain in their feet. And it can be a miserable condition. And some you, of the people watching this probably have that. Yeah, exactly. And they can't walk and they walk on a hard surface and it hurts and you know their feet burn and then they lay down at night and the covers even bother their feet and they have to sleep with their feet outside and sometimes they have to go out and stand in the snow because their feet are burning so much. These are the histories that we hear. And it's now irrefutable <laughs> based it on is. some literature that was put together last, last week that 
prediabetes causes small fiber neuropathy. This is only known for the last eight years. Can you believe that? The last eight years is where this has become substantiated and now fully recognized within the neurology community. And again, we're seeing that prediabetes where when the person has the feast of pasta and their insulin can't get all that sugar into their cells, that sugar will go to three areas, the retinas, the kidneys, and nerve tissue. And because the nerve tissue farthest away from the feet has the least blood supply, commonly that's what's affected first. And the sugar goes into these small nerves. And these small nerves don't have a lot of insulation around them. So they really swell re really easily. And when they swell, then they start to have dysfunction. And because they're the nerves that encode pain, temperature, things of that nature, then the person lots of times starts to get this miserable pain in their feet that burns. Um, and we see it consistently that once we rectify what's going on in the gastrointestinal tract, using some of the antimicrobial therapies that Dr. Rutherford alluded to, we use quite a few more than that as well. Right. Then, as blood sugar comes Quite down, the burglary. then um, then their neuropathy symptoms can start to bait. And it was interesting. Go ahead. Well, I was just saying, what makes it so? What makes him so excited about this? And what makes me pleased with it? Because I, I think a lot of you may relate to this. What Dr. Gates is trying to say is, is the medical community has standards. They're called minimum standards of care. And the minimum standard of care for those people who have peripheral neuropathy, which is what Dr. Gates described, is 50% um, of it's diabetes and 50% of it we don't know what it is. It's not your back. It's not your ankles. If it's not your neck, which can cause spinal cord problems and nerve irritations to your feet, then it's got to be diabetes. And if it's not diabetes, then we don't know what it is. A lot of the doctors will say, whoa, well, you know, you're pre-diabetes, but you're not diabetic. Yeah, so we're not going to treat you for it. And they will also not, they, they do not embrace the concept that pre-diabetes can be causing your peripheral neuropathy. So what Dr. Gates is excited about is, is we use this data in our peripheral neuropathy cases. And if a person is even borderline mm -hmm. <laughs> insulin resistance syndrome, max metabolic syndrome, and they have a gut problem, we're treating their gut, we're treating their blood sugar, and that is helping uh, the vast majority of people who have those particular clinical entities, their peripheral neuropathy is improving and getting better. So that's the exciting part about it. For mm -hmm. those of you clinically who are sitting there with those symptoms and have been told nothing can be done about it because syndrome X doesn't cause peripheral neuropathy, it does, and the literature is strong on it. And then I even know of a neurologist who was treating his patients with prediabetes with metformin. And he was <laughs> chastised by his colleagues for, why are you using metformin? They only have prediabetes. That's not going to help their neuropathy. And he consistently observed that it would help right. to a certain degree their peripheral neuropathy. And I even, you know, the title of our book is called Peripheral Neuropathy Success Stories. We've changed it back to that title, and it is evolving night by night. Um, but also, I'm going to comment on a patient who had severe metabolic syndrome where we didn't go at her blood sugar system hard enough. I was lax on it because I was trying not to have her take too many supplements. And in retrospect, when you have metabolic syndrome, you have to attack it like it's, you know, the infiltrate coming at you. And you have to throw the whole kitchen sink at a person sometimes to really correct it because if it's not corrected, then we're talking about a lifetime of consequences, not only cardiovascularly, but things neurologically, prediabetes, perfecting the small fiber neuropathy, and Alzheimer's, things of that nature. So, so anyways. This is you know, I, I think that's really the point. Yeah. I mean, I think you just summarized it. I mean, we can go on with this for hours, but I think Dr. Gage just really summarized what, um, what we have found to be true, which is if you have insulin resistance, if you come in here and your blood sugar is 101, and you got an inflamed gut, and, you, and we do a test on you, a Cyrex test, and you have intestinal permeability. I mean, we're treating your gut. We're treating your insulin resistance even though it's only 101. Maybe it was even 96 the other day, and then it was 102. Oh, my numbers are normal. I mean, I, I hear that every day, okay? But the numbers are only reflective of one aspect of your physiology. As you can see, there's a lot of things that play together here. But if you, have a, but if you definitely have been diagnosed with syndrome X or prediabetes, or metabolic syndrome, or insulin resistance, or any of those things, let me tell you, you need to get that handled. Like, not not later, not when you become 126 on your glucose three times. What, what I, think, I think one important piece of data is 
anybody who's over 5.4 right on their A1C. On their A1C, those of you who are looking at this, I'm going to assume you know what what an A1C is. Dr. Gates defined it, but but A14, I mean, your your MD is pretty ecstatic. I think right. at that point at 5.4. But if you're 5.4 or 5.5, 5.6, there's a good probability that you ha and you have a gut issue. You you don't even have to have symptoms of this. I don't sure. even know we need to sure. go into that. A lot of you are sitting there going, I don't have these symptoms in my gut. I got to tell you, you don't have to have symptoms. You could be in an early stage, but if because if you're if you're insulin resistance, it, it, I'm sorry. If you're um, if you're a HbA1c, you may know it better as. If that is 5.4, 5.5, 5.6, you likely have this small intestinal bowel overgrowth. Okay, these these bacteria in there, which means you likely have leaky gut, but you may not have symptoms of it yet. You're and and so even at that point, um, you may not have symptoms of that, but you might have other symptoms that have brought you into the office. You might have brain fog or peripheral or fibromyalgia, or whatever it is. You might have a lot of other different things. We're going to treat at that point. Mm -hmm. We're going to treat the gut, and it's it's interesting. You do the tests, the problem is there. And I mean, we've had we have we have these metabolic assessment forms. We have people fill out it's like half a page on on GI symptoms. There are symptoms of the colon and the small intestines, the ileum, the, the and they'll put all zeros. They'll put I don't have any of these symptoms, and then we'll get their tests. We'll find out that they're 5.5. On their A1C, we'll find out maybe they're a little tender when we feel their gut, but they didn't know it, um, and 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 they'll have it. We'll do the Cyrex labs, mm -hmm. and they'll have and they'll have some positive findings there for leaky gut. We treat them; they get better. They improve at the very least, and they get better. So I think that's a, that was a point that that really struck me as we started mm -hmm. treating. Like like now I look at 5.5 and go right. You got a problem? Exactly. Oh well, my blood tests are so good. My doctor is ecstatic. I know your doctor ecstatic, but you're sitting here <laughs> because you're not ecstatic because you still have a problem. This is part of the reason. Oh. So mm -hmm. I don't know. That might actually be a good spot to wrap. I up. agree. I think we've covered everything. I think, we have I the literature think attached. Point. We'll probably I'll summarize some more articles from that clipboard that I thought are important. Put that on our Facebook. Yeah. There's so much more to a GI problem relative to stabilizing it and then ultimately stabilizing your blood sugar, but you really have just uh, gotten the meat of what we're aware of is, is important to take care of. So I hope that is helpful to those of you who may have these syndromes and are looking for other ways or a way to, to control it because it is important to control. So um, we'll wrap it up with that. If you uh, want to see any of our other uh, talks that we have referenced, it's, uh, you can look up uh, our, our other hangouts or whatever they are on uh, powerhealthtalk.com. And if you have any questions, you can send them to us there also. And uh, we'll wrap this up and see you next week. Thanks for listening. Thank you.